So hello there and welcome to another tutorial. My name is Tanmay Bakshi and today we're going to be taking a look at how you can modify the Python interpreter to add your own custom functionality. This is a really interesting topic and before I get into it, I do want to start off by saying that if you enjoy this kind of content and you want to see more of it, please do make sure to subscribe to the channel as it really does help out a lot and make sure to like the video if you did enjoy it. Turn on notifications so you know when I release content just like this one today and if you have any questions, suggestions, or feedback, feel free to leave it down in the comments section below, and I'd love to get in touch. Now, diving right into this, first of all, why would you want to modify the Python interpreter? Well, I got into this when, a couple of weeks ago, one of my friends reached out to me. Uh, they were working on an assignment, and as part of this assignment, they wanted to look at the performance of allocating lists or arrays within Python. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to not only take a look at the performance of lists, but also see what's happening internally, under the hood, within the interpreter, whenever you want to, say, append something to a list? And so I did, and this led me to this whole journey of modifying the Python interpreter to get it to do what I want it to do. Uh, now, before I get deeper into that, though, I want to start off by explaining a little bit more about how lists work in programming languages in general, and then we'll get to modifying the Python interpreter. If you already know how, uh, how this works, you can skip over to the next chapter of the video where I actually explain how to modify the Python interpreter. But first, let me explain how lists and sort of resizable arrays work in general. Now, let's just say you're working with the C programming language. Of course, let's just say you want to store a collection of numbers. What you would usually do is you would, say, run a malloc for a certain number of integers, and your operating system, your kernel rather, would give you a memory buffer, and within this memory buffer, you're now free to store whatever data you want. But here's the thing. This memory buffer is technically not a resizable array in the way that we think of it in higher level programming languages like JavaScript or Python or Swift. It's a constant sized memory buffer. So you can't just append things to it willy nilly, you have to use the contents of the memory buffer that you were given. So let's just say you start off having a collection of just a single number, but now you want to add a second number. How do you do that exactly? Well, your kernel more than likely also supports another operation called a realloc. What a realloc does is it takes your original memory buffer that you've already mallocked, and it effectively helps you increase the size of that memory buffer. Now, internally within your kernel, there are two things that can happen. Either A, your kernel says, hmm, this memory buffer is already large enough, so I'll just say, all right, you can use one extra space within it. Or, let's just say, beside your memory buffer, there's a different buffer that's being used either by a different program or by your own program somewhere else. Then what the operating system will do is it'll allocate an entirely new buffer, copy over your contents, and then free the existing one. And then it'll return to you that new buffer. Effectively, no matter what happens under the hood, you now have a new memory buffer with this new size that you can use. So now you can insert your second element. And you can keep doing this every time you want to append something, you can run another, you can run another reallocation request. In a lot of the cases, these reallocation requests are really, really cheap because you just want to add, like, say, one more set of four bytes, and therefore the operating system can mostly just extend the size of your memory buffer. But there are some cases where it can't do that, and it's forced to allocate a new buffer and copy over your contents. That is slow. It's a very expensive operation. So as a programmer, you want to minimize the number of allocations and reallocations that you do, especially because then you've got to copy over the memory buffer. Uh, now, how do you do this exactly? Well, one of the most effective ways of implementing resizable arrays like this uh, is by effectively increasing the amount of capacity you reallocate every single time. So maybe you start off with a capacity for a single element, but then the next time you try to append, you actually now have capacity for two elements. Again, that's normal. You've added one extra um, element to your buffer. But now when you try to append a third, you don't just allocate three spaces, you allocate four spaces total. So you double the size of your memory buffer. Then when you're at four, you're trying to append a fifth, you don't just add a fifth, you go to eight. Again, you double the capacity of your memory buffer, even if you're only just inserting a fifth. What that means is that your sixth, seventh, and eighth insert operations are now completely free. They're a one cost. Right? It's, it's literally just the speed of how quickly you can insert something into a particular spot in RAM. And if you just keep doing this, then you will effectively have a mortized O1 cost for appending to an array. 
That is how resizable arrays work in these programming languages. And effectively, what I wanted to do was track within Python uh, how many sort of how many individual elements it actually allocates in advance when you try to append something new to a list, and then figure out if we can actually spot where the reallocations happen in a timing graph based off of spikes in the amount of time it takes to append a certain value to a list. And well, it turns out. You can do that, and so I went ahead and modified the Python interpreter to add that functionality that I acquired. And now let's get a little bit deeper into how I did that. Now Python is special; it's an interpreted programming language. That means it's not compiled. That actually makes our work. Quite a lot easier in this case, because if Python were like Swift or C, for example, then I would need to modify the underlying assembly code that they generate. However, in Python's case, it's never generating any assembly code for your code. All it's doing is it's a program looking through the code you've written and executing it quite literally, practically line by line. It's a bit more complex than that. It can do some level of just-in-time bytecode compilation, but you really don't need to worry about that as it's very rarely actually used. Uh, now, getting into how this Python interpreter works, let's just say you were to create a new list within the Python language. Well, what happens is internally, what the interpreter's done is it's created a backing structure within the C language, and that structure contains information like, for example, the capacity of this list,、uh, how many things are actually within the list, how much capacity you're using, as well as the actual pointer to the memory buffer that is backing the list in and of itself. Uh, now that structure you don't have access to within Python because you don't exactly have raw access to C structures in general in Python. When you access the list, you're accessing a Python class that is internally backed by that structure within the interpreter itself. And so, whenever you append something to a list, you're really, you know, through the call stack, calling a C function that's that's working on appending、uh, to the buffer within that list's internal structure. So here's my idea. Within that append function, there is a call to another function that is responsible for resizing the list should that become necessary. So, if I were to modify the resizing function to somehow set some kind of flag of some sort within the actual structure whenever a resize is done, then there's a way that I could potentially detect that flag from within my Python code, and I would know when the list has been resized. How did I do this exactly? Well, first of all, I took a look at where the actual list structure within C was located. I found that within a header file, and you can see that now. Then I added an extra variable to the structure for Python's list structure,、uh, and I, I call this variable was resized. It's an integer, but I really treat it as a boolean value. Its value is either going to be zero or one. Zero if the list was never resized, or one if the last append operation caused a resize internally. Then what I go ahead and do is modify the code where Python creates a new list to initialize that variable to zero in the beginning when someone creates a new list. This is important because it previously may be filled with garbage memory from whoever was using the memory buffer before malloc decided to give it to us. Then within the resize operation, if we do go ahead and call realloc, I then set the was resized flag of the Python list object structure to one. This can tell me within my Python code that the list was resized. Now I can go ahead and recompile the Python interpreter, and that's right—you just recompiled it from scratch. You've created your own build of Python, which is pretty incredible. And I can go ahead and run it. Now, a couple of things to note: first of all, the Python programming language. Isn't actually what you run on your computer. Python as a programming language is only a specification. More than likely, when you run Python in, in your terminal, you're running what's known as C Python, which is a specific implementation of the Python programming language specification. C Python is what we're actually modifying today. It's entirely open source. But once again, here's the thing: I just added a flag to the list object structure, but I don't have access to that structure within Python. So what do I do? Well, what I decided to do was actually write another bit of C code. This other bit of C code had knowledge of what the Python's list object structure is because I imported that header. And what I did was I basically created a very simple function. All this function does is it takes the pointer to the internal list object structure, and it returns to me the value of the was resized flag. Meaning I don't need to try and access that flag directly from Python because now I can just call this C code from Python to access the structure for me. And Here's what's really convenient. If the was resized flag was already set to one, it will return one to me. But first, it'll reset the flag to zero. 
meaning that if in the future another append operation does a resize, the flag has been reset, and I can detect that in the future as well. Then I put together a very simple Python script. All it does is it puts together a list and continuously pens a bunch of elements to it, and every single time a resize operation is detected through my C code, it goes ahead and resets a counter, and it creates effectively a list of how many elements were elapsed between resize operations. Now, let's go ahead and run this code and see if it works. And, as you can see, the Python script goes ahead and prints out the number of elements elapsed between individual resize elements, uh, resize operations. And as you can see, over time, it takes more and more append operations in order to trigger a resize. That is why the append operation can effectively be thought of as having O1 cost, because it amortizes over time, it averages out to effectively having O1 cost. You don't need to worry about those few times it's doing resizes. And that is how you can modify the Python interpreter to add your own custom functionality. I do hope you enjoyed this tutorial, but then again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more you can do by modifying the internals of these programming languages to do some really interesting stuff. As a matter of fact, if you want to see me modify a specific language to do a specific thing, please do feel free to leave that uh, request down in the comments section below. I'd absolutely love to take a look at it and potentially uh, create another YouTube video on modifying some more programming languages. Once again, I do hope you enjoyed that tutorial. If you did, please do make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you enjoy this kind of content, and turn on notifications so you know whenever I release a new video, and uh, leave any questions, suggestions, or feedback down in the comments section below, or reach out to me via uh, email or social media. Once again, I'd love to get in touch. Thank you very much, and goodbye, everybody.